Biography Saturday, brought to you in part by Dodge. From a and &E, this is all premiere June on Biography. All new biographies, all month long. Original lives, unique stories, 27 biography premieres. For June 3rd, 2000, Biography with Harry Smith. Survey said! His love for words and numbers made him a fortune. Long before the current game show craze, Mark Goodson created programs that enticed us to tune in and play along. We're at Television City in Los Angeles in the set of Mark Goodson's most enduring creation. It was Thanksgiving week, 1956, when The Price is Right made its debut. Goodson told colleagues that, with a little luck, the program might last one or two seasons. Forty-four years later, it's still going strong. When someone asked Goodson to reveal the secret of The Price is Right, he said if he knew, he'd produce six more shows just like it. In fact, he did have a long string of hits that attracted viewers day after day, year after year. And while he built an empire on fun and games, Goodson's own life story was anything but. And the blindfolds all in place now, panel. So, will the real Mary Ann Brett please stand up? These are some of the most familiar phrases in all of television. They are just a few examples of the genius of the man known to many as the Dean of Game Shows, Mark Goodson. He was brilliant and uh, an icon in the area of entertainment in which he worked. And he was respected throughout the industry. Goodson's talents earned him four Emmys and the distinction of having at least one show on the air every week from 1948 to the present. But these accomplishments did not bring him peace. I don't think Mark was ever happy. I, I, he, he had a very sad life in that way. He was fighting to find happiness. Even as his shows topped the ratings and earned him hundreds of millions of dollars, Goodson battled with debilitating depression. Though happiness ultimately eluded him, he did succeed in entertaining millions of game show fans around the world. Many of them are still applauding his work today. Mark Goodson was born in 1915 to Abraham and Fanny Goodson, Russian emigres who struggled to provide for their two sons. My mother was a very hard worker, and my father was a hard worker, but he never really was too successful. He tried hard, tried very hard. My father was uh, a very uh, internal person, not at all social, just the complete opposite of my mother. My mother was social, she loved card games, loved parties. Mark was especially close to his mother, but had a strained relationship with his father, who, along with the neighborhood children, tormented Mark about his chubbiness. Only story that he used to tell me, or tell me quite frequently about his dad, was he says, you know what my dad used to say to me? He said, Mark, fat smells. And I remember my dad just you know, relaying this story to me and saying his father just made him feel so bad about himself. Mark's mother provided the comfort and support that his father could not. She appreciated both his feelings and his talents. Fanny knew her son wasn't interested in sports and so encouraged him to pursue other activities. Any time that a uh, play came to town, this is Sacramento, in the early, uh, between uh, 1920 and 1930, when a traveling play came to town to need a child, uh, Ma would take Mark to the audition. And very often, in fact, usually he would get the part. Mark developed another talent early on, one that came naturally. And when we had children's parties, the thing to do was to have games, like 20 questions, spin the bottle, charades, things of that kind. And Mark was always the organizer. He always created and organized games and modified them. 
In 1930, Mark's father's search for work led the family to Hayward, California, near San Francisco. Now in high school, Mark decided to make a fresh start. He took off all the weight, and he started applying himself, and suddenly he was getting dates. People were interested in him, class body president, and his whole life took a turn. In 1932, Mark began college at the University of California at Berkeley. He was an avid student, majoring in economics and political science. He paid for college with several academic scholarships and by working part-time. He worked many jobs, but one in particular at a fish market made an indelible impression. On the weekends, he had to dip his arms into these big vats of herring, and it smelled so terribly that he spent the rest of the weekend trying to get rid of the smell. He wouldn't go out to a party at night because he knew that he smelled of herring. And I think he never got over the poverty. In 1934, Mark developed a serious lung infection. He had to be treated for several months, but couldn't afford a private hospital, and so went into the county sanitarium. I think that had a major impact on him psychology, psychologically. The feeling that he had to be there as a uh, unrelief. It, it, it was county welfare. Mark graduated Phi Beta Kappa in 1937 and got part-time work as a disc jockey at a San Francisco radio station. Next, he was offered a job as station director and announcer, where, among other things, he read the news. This was Mark's first full-time job, and he was determined to do it better than anyone else. Almost every announcer, and I became a radio announcer later, so I know what I did which was you would take it off the teletype, off the printer, and just read it, not mark. He would rewrite it completely. He was a real perfectionist. He would rewrite everything and then do the newscast. And during that time, he also came up with some ideas for some game shows on radio. And I did uh, a little game show of my own that's nonsensical that, uh, that I did way back then was called, it was, on a, it was called Pop the Question, in which, uh, you're not going to believe this, but we threw darts at balloons, red, white, and blue balloons, and if you got a red, if you hit a white balloon, you could answer a question for a dollar, a red balloon, two dollars, if you got a red, white, and a blue, it was five dollars, and this was on, on radio, where you couldn't see it. <laughs> In 1941, Mark married Bluma Nevelef, the daughter of a close friend of his mother's. Bluma was an outgoing, ambitious woman. While Mark was content to continue working in San Francisco radio, Bluma encouraged him to consider bigger and better things. Bluma was sort of really a, a driving personality. Bluma felt that Mark had a much greater future in New York. This was, of course, long before television. So uh, they pulled up stakes, went to New York, nothing, no prospects at all. Now with a baby girl named Jill, Goodson found work in New York as a freelance announcer. He took all sorts of jobs from performing as master of ceremonies for a game show to announcing soap operas. We now present the unforgettable radio drama, Front Page Farrell, the story of a cracked newspaper man and his wife, the story of David and Sally Farrell. Mark excelled at his work and may well have continued announcing if not for a completely unexpected and very frightening experience. I suddenly, after years and years of being a performer, developed mic fright. And I just could not go before a microphone. I had no way to make a living. I had a new baby. And I had to make a living some way. And so I went out and I started a dramatic show of my own. I'd, I'd never directed, except I'd been a kid actor. And I started a soap opera called Appointment with Life. 
Goodson wrote, directed, and produced several other radio shows and appeared to have a bright career ahead of him. In addition to writing drama, Goodson also began developing some ideas for quiz shows. Then Mark met a young writer named Bill Todman. Bill came from a family that was on a higher social level than Mark was used to. And so this impressed Mark and felt that they could make a team where Mark would be the creator and director and Bill would be the front selling the shows. In 1945, the year Mark's son Jonathan was born, Todman began peddling a Goodson-created quiz show called Winner Take All. In 1946, the show was sold to CBS Radio. You want to be a winner? Yeah! Then sound your buzzer, sound your bell, and play Winner Take All. Uh, the novel concept was, instead of having one person answer a question, we would have two people compete with the same question and press a button to see who came in first. Now, every quiz show in the world does that now, but it was very revolutionary. And those were called lockout devices. You hit your bell or you hit your buzzer. And the person who won would also be able to come back on and stay on, like in a soap opera. And that was also revolutionary for that day, and now it's become standard. Goodson's efforts paid off. Winner Take All was a huge hit. With their very first show, Goodson and Todman had already set a standard for innovation and perfection. You are watching Mark Goodson on Biography. A&E's look at Mark Goodson continues on Biography. What was the very first book to be printed from type? The very first bell buzzer. There's the buzzer of Adam Grice who says... The Bible. Right, Adam, and you're still champion. In the late 1940s, a war-weary nation reveled in the entertainment of the day, including radio shows. Mark Goodson and Bill Todman created and sold several successful quiz shows, including Winner Take All, Beat the Clock, and Hit the Jackpot. Goodson was the primary creative force behind the shows. He constantly worked to come up with new ideas and then labored feverishly to perfect them. Todman contributed creatively and mastered the art of selling the shows. Together, they were an unbeatable team that soon earned the attention of a new technology, television. I was um, working for CBS. I had come back from the war. A guy named Charlie Underhill was director of programs, and he said, there are two guys who had a couple of successful radio shows, and they want to put them on television. Will you go over and take a look and see if it'll work? So I went over to a show called Winner Take a Wall, where Mark was doing the warm-up. I was terribly impressed with the show and with Mark as a person. And uh, I went back and reported to Charlie Underhill that I, would, I thought it would make a good, a good television show. Now watch again while Lou and Nina give us another throw and see if you can identify this one. Ready with Bell and Buzzer. Okay, Lou, Nina? Oh, I challenge you. Didn't even wait till the throw was over. What do you say it was, Mr. Bates? That was the circle throw. The circle throw is right, and we crown a new champion. <laughs> Before the applause from their first television show had died down, Goodson and Todman were developing and pitching their next project. For years, game shows had followed an established pattern of asking a contestant questions and rewarding them for correct answers. Goodson decided to break with tradition and come up with an entirely new format. We decided to turn everything on its ear and get the panel of well-known people and use as a subject for the game an average person off the street or a celebrity and ask the panel to analyze what they did. They became therefore a human problem. It was a, a game show of real life. He was fascinated by human nature. He would sit in a restaurant and bet with you what somebody did for a living. And that's where What's My Line came from. What's My Line debuted on CBS on February 2nd, 1950. Play What's My Line. 
The show featured panelists from New York's literary and social elite trying to guess the unusual occupations of the show's guests. Researchers painstakingly searched the nation for guests whose unlikely occupation would stump the panel. The show's last segment featured a celebrity whose identity the panel tried to determine while blindfolded. Airing live Sunday nights at 10.30, the show quickly became one of the country's favorites. Uh, are you a He-Man hero type? <laughs> What's My Line was big with America because they got to live the fantasy of a New York City social scene for a half hour. We were invited to a dinner party that was magical. For a half hour, we lived the way the New York elite lived. What's My Line became a phenomenon. President Eisenhower never missed a show. Whenever the Duke and Duchess of Windsor were in New York, they spent their Sunday evenings at the live broadcasts. The show's cast was treated like royalty, and for the first time in his life, Mark Goodson attained a social and economic position he was proud of. Frankly, it was what gave Mark status in New York beyond just being a game show producer. He became, in effect, um, someone who palled around with uh, the owner of Random House, Bennett Cerf, with Arlene, with Dorothy Kilgallen, and it was, as I say, what made New York very special for him and made him special in New York. Mr. Sir, would your mother be one of the great... For starstruck audiences, What's My Line delivered like no other show of its time. Celebrities who never appeared on any other game show sat in the mystery guest's chair. For the most part, they were charming, but occasionally things didn't go so smoothly. One of the most legendary near catastrophes occurred when Judy Garland couldn't be found just prior to her entrance. And I'll sweep up this. Finally, with I think 20 seconds to go, she came down the stairs and into the Senator studio <laughs> and said, the blank is all the uh, confusion. We've got 20 seconds yet. During the early 1950s, Goodson and Todman built an empire around the success of What's My Line. Goodson created several variations of the show, all revolving around some unusual facet of human nature. In each case, a panel tried to find out something about the contestants. I've got a secret, it's news to me, the name's the same, and others helped make Goodson and Todman the largest packager of game shows in the country. While Todman quietly offered his input and sold the shows, Goodson became known throughout the industry as a hands-on producer who demanded and delivered perfection. Sometimes he was uh, very... I wouldn't say he was rough, but uh, he expected things to be done his way, absolutely. And usually, I would say 90-something percent of the time, he was right. So everybody went along with him. You wanted his approval. That's what you really wanted. You know, you were really kind of uh, in awe of him when he was uh, in the room. He, uh, he demanded, uh, you know, he demanded that you paid attention. Goodson's power grew to the point that he challenged some of the network's attempts to enforce Senator Joe McCarthy's censorship of alleged communists. In one instance, CBS wanted Goodson to fire Henry Morgan, one of the panelists on I've Got a Secret. Determined not to let that happen, Goodson asked the show's host, Gary Moore, to support him in his stand against the network. I went over to see Gary and I said, look, as far as I'm concerned, if you're willing to say you won't do the show, I'm willing to say I won't do the show. So he said, I'm with you, kid. So we called up the agency and we said, no Henry Morgan, no show. And they buckled. Goodson openly acknowledged that he owed his success to his wife, Bluma, that without her encouragement, he never would have come to New York. Now he felt he had changed, outgrown her, and in 1956 got a divorce. I had no idea there was, there was a problem. One day he wasn't there. One day he was living someplace else. And it was uh, kind of a distancing thing because I only got to see him on weekends after that. 
Goodson focused his energies on his work. In 1956, he came up with another variation of What's My Line, where a panel of celebrities cross-examined three persons who claimed the same identity. The show was called To Tell the Truth. You will each question until you hear this signal, and at the end of the questioning period, you will be asked to cast your vote for the one who, in your opinion, is the real Walter Castle. And let's start this opening round of questioning tonight with Kitty Carlisle. Kitty? Thank you, bud. No he left no stone unturned to make it perfect. We rehearsed with dummy people and with dummy markups, and then he would change the way we put our uh, votes on the panel. He would change the way we sat. He was, he was meticulous. And that, you know, is part of genius. The show was nearly as popular as What's My Line. Goodson and Todman celebrated their first 10 years in television as the undisputed kings of game shows. Their success had made them millionaires and made their names household words. Their success generated interest from Hollywood. In 1958, Goodson and Todman established offices in Los Angeles. Though they dabbled in television drama and film, Goodson in particular was reluctant to venture too far out onto a limb that could come crashing down at any moment. He did a show called The Rebel, and uh, something with Chuck Connors called Branded. Yet, basically, he was a master of his genre. And he, he loved being extremely successful at what he did. Twelve long years ago. Goodson and Todman dominated the game show business. They had a few competitors, but none who came anywhere close to their level of success. One of their rivals was a man named Lou Cowan, a former partner of Goodson's on one of his early radio shows. Back in the late 1940s, Cowan had pitched Goodson an idea for a new game show. And he showed me this paper, which he called the $64,000 question. And uh, I looked at the format and I said, there's a problem with this show. You can't really make this thing work unless you fix it. In 1958, Goodson's instincts proved correct when the producers of the $64,000 question were caught giving contestants answers in advance of the questions. Other game shows were also implicated in the quiz show scandal, but not one of Goodson and Todman's. The rules of the game were sacrosanct to him. It's not a game if you're going to cheat. It's like cheating at solitaire. Unless you win by playing within those parameters, it's... Uh, it, doesn't mean anything. I think that probably kept him more honest than anything else. Game shows really was Mark's whole involvement in life, almost. He worked 24 hours a day. In other words, mentally, he never stopped working. And he would take an idea and worry it to death, sometimes for over a year before it came out exactly the way he wanted it. Goodson's passion for creating new shows blended perfectly with his innovative genius. He loved words and numbers and enjoyed watching people puzzle over intellectual exercises. In 1956, he debuted The Price is Right, the first game show directed at housewives, where contestants guessed the price of common household items. In 1961, Password challenged its players to use word associations to come up with the mystery word. The yeah, sweater. Knit. That's a 200. Um, Password was also the first game show to pair up contestants with celebrities. 1961 was a particularly good year for Goodson. Password was a huge hit, and he got married to Virginia McDavid, a former Miss Alabama. Virginia was an extremely beautiful girl, just stunning, stunning woman. When she walked in the room, people said, oh, my God, look at that gorgeous, you know, and Mark loved that. He loved her looks. The couple had a baby girl, Marjorie, in 1962. Life was good for Mark Goodson. He loved to bring home his creations. So I remember playing Password with him when Password was still being developed or, or trying to play, to tell the truth. I played I've Got a Secret and What's My Line all the time. I remember one time playing What's My Line with him and I stumped him and I was so proud of myself and they finally after not being able to figure out what 
the hell I was. He said, all right, I give up, what are you? And I said, I'm a bum, I don't have a job. <laughs> These happy moments were some of the few Mark Goodson had with his family. His demand for perfection and growing insecurities would prove to be a destructive combination. You are watching Mark Goodson on Biography. A&E's look at Mark Goodson continues on Biography. In 1963, Goodson and Todman had a remarkable four and a half hours of primetime programming on five nights a week. Much of their success came from Goodson's remarkable ability to create and perfect new game shows. I think it was 90% perspiration. He was up all night sometimes with a yellow pad, and sometimes two nights, and sometimes three, and then he'd come in and he'd say, let's try this, and it was brilliant. I would often talk with him about things like triple redundancy. If he had a scoring device that was new, that our artistic director had developed, he'd say, that's fine, but what if it doesn't work? What's, what's our backup? And then there'd be a hand-painted scorekeeping device. Okay. But what if the painters don't show up on time? And it worked. I mean, the fact is, the shows looked effortless. Goodson also had the wisdom to surround himself with some of the best and the brightest colleagues available. Men like Bob Stewart and Alan Sherman, both of whom went on to independent success. To his employees, Mark was a formidable force, determined to do things his way. He was difficult to work with in a sense that he had to dictate every move. And those of us who are free spirits were really not crazy about that. Goodson's intensity became legendary, as did his insecurities. The combination was sometimes difficult to deal with. One of Mark's problems was that he applied to his personal life some of the same desire for perfection so that if he wanted somebody, for example, to meet him for dinner at 7 p.m., he would ask, you know, how are you going to get there? Well, you know, I'll, I'll take a cab. Well, what if the cab's, you know, what if it's raining? How are you going to get there? Well, after a while, it would drive some people batty, and they'd stop having dinner with him. At home, Mark could be just as demanding as he was at the office. Virginia did not appreciate Mark's intensity. The couple's relationship grew increasingly stormy. The fights were, were about nothing, as many fights among couples are. It's, it's, it's just, it's part of a syndrome of, of uh, tension. Those little spats about, you know, whether this should go here or there or whatever it was. But they were quite unpleasant. Mark and Virginia separated in 1963 and were divorced in 1971. His second failed marriage left Mark deeply depressed. You hate to see anybody in pain, and he took things very deeply. He, he never was one of those nice middle of the road people. He, he, everything was a, went right to the core. Adding to Goodson's woes was the first serious downturn of his career. Television dramas and situation comedies began displacing game shows from prime time. From 1950 to the late 60s, there was always a Mark Goodson game show on in prime time. Then in 1969, they all were wiped off the map except one syndicated show. And I believe that was to tell the truth. So the early 70s was a tough time for Goodson and Todman. Goodson and Todman rose to the challenge. They decided to take their biggest nighttime shows from the 60s and make them bigger and better daytime shows for the 70s. Their improvements included new spectacular sets, more celebrities, and bigger prizes. Password returned as a big hit, as did Match Game, the first sexually risque game show. Sarah Lee was thrown out of the bake-off when they caught her blanking the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> Charles Nelson Riley characterized it perfectly one day when we were sitting around in the dressing room during the lunch break. He said, this is not a job, this is a social engagement. And he was right. Just a bunch of people got together and had a lot of laughs. 
What would turn out to be Goodson and Todman's biggest hit of all was also a revamped show from the 60s, The Price is Right. He described what the new Price is Right would be. And uh, I thought immediately that this show would do well. And I said, so he asked me, he said, what do you think, Bob? And I said, I, th I think it'll work. And he said, I do too. He said, I think we'll have a pretty good run with this. <laughs> well, we had a pretty good run and are having a pretty good run 28 years later. He was so right. $600. The actual retail price of your showcase is $4,730. <laughs> Many of Goodson and Todman's daytime game shows of the early 70s were huge hits, earning their owners tens of millions of dollars. They continued to rule game show television with several hit shows versus their competitors' occasional solo success. There was a time when, at certain time periods in New York, we had shows on all three networks uh, competing against each other. Goodson now owned opulent residences in New York and Beverly Hills, a Rolls Royce, and original Picasso artworks. He was one of the country's most eligible bachelors until 1972, when he married Suzanne Waddell. He had the most wonderful, original mind. I was mad about him. He taught me so much. He told me things that I never knew about. He taught me words. He taught me about places. He, he just was constantly, and I mean, this is true until the day that Mark died. I was always his student, and I loved that relationship. Mark and Suzanne's marriage was filled with glamour and excitement. They hosted New York's best parties and vacationed internationally. But as much as Suzanne got to know Mark's generosity and dedication, she also got to know his darker side. For in spite of all of his success, Goodson was growing increasingly insecure and anxious. He developed several neuroses, including hypochondria. I got a phone call and he said, Suzanne, you're gonna have to come and get me. He said, I have amnesia and I have no idea how to get to the studio. And that afternoon, I called a doctor that I knew at UCLA, and I said, Mark wants an MRI. He thinks that he's got brain cancer. We went over and had one. Now, this is crazy, totally crazy. Though some of his behavior was confusing, some of Goodson's unhappiness made sense. He shared with his wife feelings of inadequacy that stemmed back to childhood. He sought help through psychoanalysis. More than anything else, he wanted to be appreciated. He never felt that people really approved of him. I think that in many ways, Mark was ashamed of what he did. He was great at it, but he would have rather been a theatrical producer or a movie producer and made great, great, important works. I do think there was a certain sense of inferiority when he ran into these big name producers, the Spielbergs and the people like that, the, here he was, a game show producer. Despite his many achievements, Mark Goodson was a tormented man. His increasing unhappiness affected his marriage, which in turn affected his work. It became very complicated and it became very obtrusive in a way, and it, it cr created a roadblock to creativity where we would go in and say, look, why do we do this on, uh, on uh, to tell the truth? He'd say, wait, I want to tell you what happened last night with Suzanne and Simon. And he'd say, and I was with her and I did this, and what should I do? What should I do? And we'd all sit around trying to solve his problems for him because we wanted him not to be in such pain. The pain was about to get much worse. Biography's look at Mark Goodson will continue. But first, do you know the answer to tonight's bio trivia? Which sports figure appeared as the mystery guest on the premiere episode of What's My Line in 1950? Log on to biography.com for the answer. You are watching Mark Goodson on Biography. As television entered the 90s, it marked the first decade that Mark Goodson wasn't a dominant force on the air. 
That was only true in America, however, because around the world, foreign versions of many of his game shows continued to run successfully. Now, what is the price of tonight's showcase? I used to travel all over the world teaching them how to do these shows in their own way. In other words, their own MCs, their own panelists, and where necessary, rule changes. And most of them are still going. Price is Right is the biggest thing in Europe. After more than 50 years of being the leading creator and producer of game shows, Goodson could have rested on his laurels, but he didn't. He continued working with the same trademark intensity. Someone once said to Mark, after years of success, it's, they, they said, Mark, Mark, why do you continue to try to prove something that you've already proved? Meaning, how many more successes do you want? But I think it just became uh, the most important thing in his life, perhaps. Mark always wanted uh, more. More success, more shows on the air, more beautiful women. He was never, I mean, he was a man who was in the Fortune 400, the Forbes 400. Um, his wealth was listed as, you know, three or four hundred million dollars. Um, he was further down on the list than he wanted to be. Now in his 70s, Goodson continued working as hard as ever. Then, in the fall of 1992, he developed a high fever. Within a matter of weeks, his doctor found the cause, pancreatic cancer. Two months later, on December 18th, surrounded by family and friends, Mark Goodson died. Just a few months earlier, he became the first game show producer to be inducted into the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame. In the 1990s, new versions of Family Feud and Match Game aired, making it three and four straight decades, respectively, that those shows have been on television. Leading the way is The Price is Right, the longest-running game show in history. If you have a really good format, it will work. Price is Right works all over the world. Family Feud in England is called Family Fortune. I just got an email from Poland. Our producer over in Poland wants our producer of Family Feud here to send a little message congratulating them on their 500th show. Uh, they work all over the world. Mark Goodson is remembered as one of television's greatest creators and producers. His innovation set the standard for game shows. In addition to his shows, Goodson will be remembered by many as a man who gave a lot of himself to a lot of others. We're shooting now at the Mark Goodson screening room at the AFI in California. There's a Mark Goodson screening room at the Museum of Television and Radio in New York. Uh, there's a Mark Goodson building at Cedar sinai There are Mark Goodson scholarships at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, I'd like to say that's part of his legacy. I miss him very much. Um, he taught me the things that I live with are the, the, the things that he taught me as a, as a person, you know, about kindness and fairness and, and how to treat people. I mean, those are the things that I live with. Goodson's gifts reached millions of people. He brought excitement and entertainment into homes around the world on almost a daily basis. That's something his closest friends and family hope brought him some measure of pride. I think Mark, I don't know, wherever he is, might, might feel that way now. I don't know. He might, I think he felt that way when he was alive. He felt that he was doing something good. And he did. He did something very good. I began to realize that while money will, you know, attracts people to shows, no question about it, that the real drive to be on a game show um, is the urge to have your day in the sun, to, 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 to get that sense of being a celebrity yourself, to get out of the gray drabness of, your, of, the, of the ordinary part of your life. 
There's a daily ritual here at the Price is Right studio in Los Angeles. Each morning, prospective contestants form a long line on Beverly Boulevard. They are young, they're old, they're from towns all across America, all of them hoping to hear that exciting invitation to come on down. More than 40 years after Mark Goodson dreamed up The Price is Right, it remains one of the highest rated shows on daytime television. And another Goodson creation is coming back to tell the truth which also made its debut in 1956, is returning to TV in the fall. The producers say the format will be almost identical to the original because they say there's no need to change a winning formula. Monday on Biography, all premiere June continues with Morgan Fairchild. Known on screen as a predatory vixen, off screen she's able to parody her image and devote her time to causes like A's research. Morgan Fairchild, Monday. For a and &E, I'm Harry Smith. Thanks for being with us. a and &E Home Video proudly presents the biography you've just seen. For $14.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-423-1212. Or visit our online store at biography.com. Now, Trouble Under the Big Top spells a circus-sized mystery to die for on Murder, She Wrote, next on A&E. For the web's best bios, log on to biography.com.